Hey guys, Chris here again. Welcome to my second ML agents config video, which is about the hyperparameters. You might have noticed that the configuration structure has changed with ML agents release 3. For the 3D ball environment, a config update would look like this with changes highlighted in red. Another thing is that nearly all arguments have default values now. So let's remove the arguments that are matching with the default value. Wow, that's quite a lot. I'd probably still include them for readability, but yeah, you don't have to. Anyway, like in the video before, I'll stick with the config from release one to keep it consistent. The way the parameters work hasn't changed at all. And that's what you're going to learn here. So let's get started with parameters that are available for both PPO and SAC. First one being the learning rate. A high learning rate will result in a strong update of the neural network's weights. A small learning rate results in a small update of the weights. So what's better? A small value, because the weights are updated many times during training. That way, the weights are carefully adjusted to slowly improve the agent. If the values are too high, we lose prior knowledge from previous observations. So if you want the agent to keep its long-term memory, set the parameter to a value in between this range. If training is unstable and the reward does not increase consistently, try decreasing the learning rate. If it is stable though, you can consider increasing it to speed up training. But keep in mind that training might become unstable. Let's continue with the learning rate schedule. The value of the learning rate can either stay constant or decrease linearly to zero. If you have an environment that changes a lot or an agent that you don't want to train once but continuously, I'd recommend using a constant learning rate. Otherwise, I'd use a linear learning rate, which should result in a better and more stable training. Please note that SAC is not designed for a linear learning rate and should therefore always be used with a constant learning rate. Next one is the batch size parameter. And for this one, I think it helps to know that an agent experience consists of three steps. First, observing the environment at time step X. Second, taking an action. Third, observing the environment and received reward at time step x plus 1. With a batch size, you can determine how many of those experiences are collected and fed into the neural network to produce a neural network update. The update itself consists of another three steps. First, feeding the neural network with the observations. Second, neural network error calculation step based on the received rewards, and third, adjusting the weights based on their error participation. With this said, let's look at the ranges and recommendation. Ranges differ for continuous and discrete action spaces. As recommendation, I'd say stay in those ranges and if training is unstable, think about adjusting the value closer to the upper bound of the range to improve training stability with the cost of slower learning. That's it for the batch size. Next one is buffer size, which is another parameter related to experiences. It is important to know that this parameter is fundamentally different between PPO and SAC. For PPO, this parameter specifies after how many collected experiences a policy model update occurs. With SAC, however, the parameter defines the size of the experience replay buffer and not the update frequency, which for SAC is specified in a parameter named steps per update. More about that later in the video. From a configuration point of view, this value should be multiple times larger than the batch size. If training is unstable, you might want to consider increasing this value without leaving the recommended range to improve training stability with the cost of slower learning. That's it for the hyperparameters that are available for both PPO and SAC. 
let's now look at the ones that are only available for PPO. Let's start with beta, which you might remember from the TensorBoard video. This parameter specifies how random the policy is at the beginning of training. If this value is high, the agent takes more random actions and therefore explores more of the environment. During training, beta decreases linearly from its start value to zero. There's also a graph called entropy that helps identifying if beta is too high or too low. Let's look at the entropy and cumulative reward graphs with different beta values. I'd recommend pausing the video at this point if you want to spend some time analyzing the graphs. As you can see, it is possible to see that beta is too low or too high based on the entropy. But it is not trivial considering that you might just see a single graph. So make sure to look for unsteadiness in the entropy graph, which is a good indicator for a non-optimal beta value. If you have a sharp drop in your graph, it's an indicator for a beta value that is too low. If the entropy decreases very slowly, beta might be too high. We can also see that all graphs converge to a similar reward, some faster and some slower. So if you're not having a super complex environment where training takes a long time, you can't do so much wrong with the beta value, especially if you stay in the recommended range, which I clearly didn't in the tests. Next parameter is called epsilon and is related to the policy update that occurs each x experiences with x being the value of the buffer size parameter. If I understood epsilon correctly, the value specifies the percentage of how much the policy can change. This is to avoid too strong policy updates when experiencing a set of uncommon experiences. The ML agents team recommends setting this value between 0.1 and 0.3 and I saw some recommendations on other sites to set this value to 0.2 which fits into the range. Let's now look at the graphs for different runs with epsilon values of 0.1, 0.2 and 0.3. We can see that this parameter always decreases from its starting value to 0.1 during training which makes sense since a 30% change, for example, might be okay at early training stages, but not at later ones. In the TensorBoard video, I said that the value always decreases to half its size, which is just correct for 0.2, as you can see. The correct statement, therefore, is that it always decreases to 0.1. So my recommendation for Epsilon is just set it to 0.2 and leave it there. This parameter doesn't affect the results too much and 0.2 has always been a good choice for me. Next one is lambda, which is a parameter that is not so easy to understand. When you watched my ML agent's TensorBoard video, you might remember that I talked about the agent being in different states based on the observations and that the agent assigns values to those states to know how valuable they are in respect to future estimated reward. With lambda, you can basically regularize how much the agent should rely on those state values when calculating updated ones. A low value results in the agent relying more on the current values, while a high value results in relying more on the actual rewards that the agent received. So it is a trade-off between a more biased agent and a one that has a higher variance in its state values. It is absolutely okay if you don't fully understand this for now. It goes deep into the reinforcement learning concepts and I'm thinking about making dedicated videos about this in the future, where I'll start with simple grid world examples to explain those concepts. So my recommendation for this parameter, just try out different values in the bounds of the typical range and compare the results. Let's continue with numepoch, which is the last hyperparameter for PPO, and it's an easy one. It's related to the batch size, which specifies how many experiences are collected before running them through the neural network to make weight updates. With numepoch, you can now specify how often the experiences are going through the neural network. So, if you set this to 10, for example, the neural network will go through the experiences 10 times, which results in 10 weight updates. 
Therefore, training will be faster, but also not as stable compared to using a smaller value like 3, resulting in only 3 weight updates. It's like increasing the learning rate, with a slightly different effect. So, if you don't have time constraints, I'd set this to a low value. You can also go below 3 and set it to 2 or 1, but training will become very slow and stability won't improve that much compared to setting it to 3. That's it for the PPO hyperparameters. Let's look at the SAC specific hyperparameters with the first one being buffer init steps. I had a hard time understanding this one cause I haven't heard of it before. Luckily I stumbled across this box on the OpenAI platform which states our SAC implementation uses a trick to improve exploration at the start of training. For a fixed number of steps at the beginning, set with the start steps keyword argument, the agent takes actions which are sampled from a uniform random distribution over valid actions. After that, it returns to normal SAC exploration. So they named it start steps and the ML agents team named it buffer init steps. But yeah, it's the same trick they are using. Therefore, my recommendation here, try it and if it helps, use it. I think you can't do anything wrong with this additional exploration phase at the beginning. Only thing I'd recommend is that if you use it, it would make sense that the exploration phase lasts at least a few episodes so that the agent can explore properly. The next parameter is init underscore end coef, which is another parameter related to exploration. It's basically the same as beta, but for SAC. Only difference is that the value decreases exponentially during training and not linearly, like with beta. That's also the reason why this value can basically be set to 1 without any problems. So, like with beta, increase this to support exploration and decrease it to converge to a solution faster with the risk of missing out on reward. The third SAC specific parameter we discuss is save replay buffer, which defaults to false. What it does when set to true is saving the current experience replay buffer whenever a model checkpoint is reached. Setting it to true only makes sense if you train an agent with knowing that it will not be fully trained in one session and you want to resume training at some point. The resume training will then be smoother because the experience replay buffer that SAC relies on is still there and not wiped. Otherwise, SAC can't sample from the replay buffer for the first minutes after resuming training. The ML agents team warned that the experience replay buffer might take a considerable amount of space on the disk. So I decided to give it a try and see the effects when setting this to true. I first tried it with the push block environment which has 70 raycast observations and a buffer size set to 50k. As you can see, the saved replay buffer is close to 10 megabytes during training which shouldn't be a problem on any computer today. Let's now see what happens when we drastically increase the observation size by using the visual push block environment with a buffer size of 50k and an observation space of 21,168 through 84 by 84 RGB images. Okay, we got 423 megabytes, which is still not that much. Keep in mind that we already had a big observation space. If we would increase the buffer size to a million, the file size would go up to around 10 gigabytes, where it starts becoming interesting whether to save it or not. And if we then also have an observation space of around a million, file sizes and storage options should be thought about. So, unless you're using a buffer size in the millions combined with visual observations in the millions, you should be good to go. Let's continue with the next parameter, which is steps per update. Another parameter that is related to the experience replay buffer. The value that we set here determines after how many agent steps the policy is getting updated by sampling a batch from the replay buffer. The size of the batch is determined by the value set for the batch size parameter. 
The lower the steps per update value, the more CPU power and time will be used for updating the model by going through experiences in the replay buffer instead of collecting experiences from the environment. This increases the sample efficiency but slows down training. A good rule of thumb is setting this value to the number of agents active in the scene. If using an environment that runs only with a few frames per second, a high sample efficiency might be desired, so decreasing the steps per update value can help speed up training. The last parameter is tau, which I honestly don't fully understand. What I know is that it is related to one of the two neural networks that are used for SAC. However, the ML agents team states that this value should basically always be 0.005, so it shouldn't be a big deal if we are not fully understanding what's happening here. That's it, I hope you learned a lot. Please make sure to like the video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks and I hope to see you in the next video.